welcome to the Rare Fishing Channel. Today we will share information about around the sea world. Let's explore the sea. Yellowfin tuna fishing. Baiting tuna. New Zealand is a great place to catch a wide variety of sport fish. The record books graphically proving that many of them reach their maximum size while feeding in our surrounding waters. Along southern yellowtail, and several species of shark, there are also lesser sport fish. Such as silver trevally and squirefish not as big as the other, but at least as courageous of heart and all tough propositions on light tackle. Anglers come from all over the world to catch these fish, as well as for our broadbill swordfish, big eye and yellow fin tuna. Although yellowfin are caught throughout New Zealand, by far the biggest concentration of tuna activity occurs in the Bay of Plenty region. They tend to arrive around late December and carry on through to April, usually starting out in front of the port of Fakadana and spreading out along the east coast to take Kaha and Waihau Bay. What makes this tuna fishery a particularly interesting and challenging one, is that the methods used to catch them vary greatly from season to season. Fishing Meatballs A situation that sees day upon day of tightly packed balls of bait fish being smashed to pieces on the sea's surface. Usually by a mixture of yellowfin, skipjack and albacore tuna as well as the odd whale and some huge, oceanic bronze whaler sharks. It's usually possible to entice the besieged baitfish into seeking refuge around the boat's hull, especially around the propeller and rudder area. If good numbers of feeding skipjack tuna are constantly patrolling and raiding, the anchovies find it in their best interests to stay put. The sound and vibrations of feeding fish and birds will eventually attract larger predators, it's just a case of whether you have the time to wait around. This might include actions such as squirting hoses onto the sea surface, or splashing the water around with a broom or spade. Predatory pressure, or changing water temperatures and currents, often serve to encourage the bait fish to rise up and cling to the boat. Be prepared to take a scoop at any time. When predators move in, the bait fish are often pressured up to the surface around the boat's hull and can be scooped up with a long-handled, fine mesh net. While it's nice to have a good supply of these bait fish on hand to help start or prolong a hot bite, reasonable numbers of live fish left around the hull serve to attract and hold tuna in the near vicinity. What bait and how to look after them? Although the majority of yellowfin tuna are generally feeding on pilchards and anchovies, most tuna fishermen do not use them for bait unless the pilchards are quite large. Small baits tend to attract too much unwanted attention from skipjack, albacore and baby yellowfin, rather than the big boys, in our case averaging 60 to 120 pound. As a result, various species of live mackerel are often used instead, the ideal all-round size being around 10 to 12 inches long. Of course larger baits can be used, live skipjack for example, but it can be hard to wait for that extra big, extra hungry fish to come along and eat such baits. 
whatever the baits happen to be, make an effort to keep them in as good a shape as possible. This means minimizing the handling of them, right from the point of capture through to retrieving them from the live bait well and hooking them on. Instead, they position the wriggling bait over the open bait well and use the back of a butter knife to slide up the shank of the hook. Until the curve of the hook is reached and the hook becomes upside down, the eye of the hook now facing downwards. When scooping them out as baits later on, use soft, small mesh nets and try to avoid taking deep scoops. This often results in several baits being caught at once and can damage their protective body slime. Rigging Basics The breaking strain of traces and size of hooks will change from day to day and must take into account the size of fish present. The breaking strain of the main line and how big the baits are, in general however, the heavier the main line, the thicker the trace should be. An exception involves some of the latest super thin leader products, such as Jinkai. Although it may appear on occasion that the tuna are so hungry that they will even take baits presented on wire hawser. At other times they may seem to have become vegetarians, such as their frustratingly fussy attitude. When this happens, some anglers will forego a trace, especially on 24 and 37 kg tackle, simply tying a hook on the end of their main line. As for the hook, it should always be relative to the size of the bait and, if in doubt, it is better to go a little small than too big. All hooks must be strong enough to withstand the breaking strain of the main line without bending or breaking. Hook Placement There are numerous ways to hook live baits, but two factors mainly determine the hook placement in the end. The live baiting method and rig, and the physiological nature of the bait used. In New Zealand, nose hooking and back hooking predominates, but anal and collar hooking is starting to get a few fans as well. I mainly shoulder hook my baits as they remain lively for long periods of time and the hook up ratio is high. Both straight and curved patterns of hooks can be used, but make sure that the curve of the hook enables the point and barb to remain well clear of the body. Provided the hook is not set too deeply, the mackerel will remain very active, sending out strong vibrations that are more likely to be picked up by predatory fish. In the anal hooking, this method is a real surprise to me. I thought bringing bait fish in backwards would kill it in short order but in this case it doesn't far from it, in fact. This position hardly ever ends up accidentally double hooking the bait, and hooks up well. Float fishing. I will never forget the first time I saw a yellowfin jumping clear of the water all around my float as they pursued my live bait, prior to one of them gobbling it down and smoking off. Although some baits might be powerful enough to initially pull the float down, when they tire a few minutes later, the float is usually able to bob back up to the surface again.
This allows the float to be threaded onto 4 meters of shock leader above a ball bearing swivel which in turn is tied to a short, 60 cm fluorocarbon trace. This setup allows the mackerel to swim out from the relative safety of the boat, with the downward pressure of the moving mackerel. The lip bait is now set deep enough to avoid unwanted attention from most predatory birds, but when eaten by a tuna and later brought both side. Enabling the angler to wind right to the short fluorocarbon trace if necessary, eliminating the need for a trace man and helping the gaff shot. Brightly colored floats should be used if possible. This makes them easier to see, so the angler is less likely to unwittingly tangle with the other lines. Or wind in and find that the bait has swum around the propeller, rudder or bow. They enable anglers to position there to take advantage of any likely looking action. The greater surface area of the balloon is affected by the wind and current more, so these natural forces can be harnessed by anglers. Conversely, air can be let out of the balloon so that it is very small, minimizing the effects of a wind against tide situation. Tie the balloon on with two or three strands of cotton. Thanks for watching this video. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe this channel. See you later!